go ahead and start. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you to our Zoom audience as well. We're delighted to welcome Rachel Beatty Riedel, who is the John S. Knight Professor of International Studies and Director of the Ainati Center for International Studies and Professor in the Department of Government at Cornell University. Her research interests include institutional development in new democracies, local governance and decentralization policy, authoritarian regime legacies, and religion and politics with a regional focus in Africa. Previously, she was an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Northwestern University, trading one wintry place for another. <laughs> and she is the co-host of the podcast, Ufa Hulu Africa, featuring weekly episodes of news highlights and interviews about life and politics on the African continent. We're delighted to be presenting research today, um, new research on Benin and South Africa. Thank you so much. And is this too clicker? It's up oh, on there. Oh, it's oh not. just kidding. It's not. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us today and those who are online as well. The beauty of both worlds as we ease into uh, being in person. I'm really so pleased to be presenting this project to you because it's a project that I hope addresses the bigger questions that we in the United States, in the world globally, are interested in in this particular moment of what we might call democratic backsliding, a period of global autocratization, and the ways in which institutions, formal institutions of democracy, are being used, repurposed um, for these autocratizing trends. So this project uh, about democratic resilience and challenges in specifically looking at Benin and South Africa is telling us that a democracy is a fragile thing in all types of democracies, and that in enduring and resilient, sustaining democracy is not the, simply the flip side of a coin of democratic uh, backsliding. Indeed, the processes of maintaining and sustaining democracies are particular to uh, those types of institutions and, and mobilizations. And we need to be able to look into them in more detail to be able to understand exactly how democracy is maintained, particularly in challenging places, but also in the world, places in the world where we thought it was perhaps most consolidated um, and, and um, enduring. So the possibility of democratic collapse where we least have expected it across the world has added really a new urgency to this age old question of how democracy once attained can be made to last, to endure, and to be sustained. Let's see. Let me switch you. Sorry. Okay, I think that's all right. Thank you. Great. This project today, the research that I'm presenting today, is part of a broader project that is co-led by um, Tarek Massoud and Scott Mainwaring, and is looking at democracy in, in um, challenging places across the world, particularly places that are um, ethnically heterogeneous, that defy expectations of modernization theory in terms of being lower on the levels of democracy, uh, uh, industrialization and economic development. And there are a few contributions of the project overall that um, my research contributes to and um, the project uh, attempts to um, uh, contribute overall. And first, as I said, is that dem democratic survival is not simply kind of the flip side of the coin, but really about de deepening mechanisms of stasis and constant mobilization against backsliding. We see that in the United States, in Eastern and Western Europe, and in Africa, um, as, as in South Africa and Benin. One of its second major goals is really to look at the placement of actors, parties, politicians, movements, and militaries, and how they interact with institutions um, that can be used either for democratic maintenance or democratic subversion. The third question that the project addresses overall is the question of what drives actors to behave in democratic sustaining ways. Now the project as a whole actually takes different positions on this. There are some of the authors in the volume and in the project that argue that normative commitments, ideological commitments to democracy are truly crucial for democratic endurance, particularly in these places in which it's extremely challenging to survive. I, on the other hand, and some of the other contributors argue that it is not about normative commitments or ideological commitment to democracy, 
but rather the ways in which strategic bargains of power sharing, of, re of resource distribution among contesting elites allowed both the crafting and initiation of democratic institutions in time one and commitment to enduring and sustaining them over longer periods. And thirdly, the way in which institutions themselves lock in those types of democratic systems, even after the elite bargains start to shift away. And so that the third part of kind of the institutional constraint is something that we'll um, explore in more detail, particularly over the last several years of the ways in which democratic challenge is really threatening democracy in Benin and in South Africa to different degrees, and pertains to questions of the United States and other advanced industrial democracies, um, the ways in which democratic institutions are being challenged by elites themselves as an intra-elite bargain um, breaks down and resource distribution is, is unequally shared. So this question is, you know, do we need democratic commitment and ideology to sustain democracy? And I'm really taking the position of arguing, no, that's not what led to its formation, nor its endurance. The fourth contribution of the project is to focus on causal mechanisms and to really understand the processes by which the macro level correlates that are so underwhelming in these cases, right? So non-conducive to democracy are overcome by the processes of enduring uh, democracy. <laughs> so sorry. We can tell that I've been out of practice in um, is the arrow not working? No. Look, I'm looking at the ceiling anyway. <laughs> Who wants to get up on the chair? I, I will do that. Does it work with the mouse? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, okay, but I can't go back. No, Sorry, that's perfect. Right. No, that's perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. These are all our hybrid practices coming into place. Great. There you go. Great. Thank you. So then should I take the mouse as well? Sure. sure. And it's just click the middle button. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. So as we know, there are many places in the world that are perhaps not conducive to democracy, right? The places from which we wouldn't expect democracy to emerge or to be sustained. And yet these are exactly the cases in which we can best learn how democracy can be made resilient that can perhaps give us greater um, logic into understanding this moment of democratic backsliding globally and what types of processes might help it to be sustained across the world. So in Africa, as you know, many, many of the kind of founding conditions that we might think of correlates for sustaining democracy are miss missing in terms of having overall low levels of economic development, high levels of ethnic heterogeneity, low levels of state capacity, right? And all of the types of, um, of barriers that we might expect that make a democracy likely to uh, arise in the first place. And then the question is, once transitions happen, right? We see popular protests, we see mobilization, we see opportunities, we see the Arab Spring, we see the, the third wave, but how can democracy be sustained in the, under these conditions? So the, um, the, my work as a whole um, suggests that there are four different types of transition pathways um, that we might uh, imagine uh, get us to various outcomes in terms of democratization in the top two or new forms of authoritarianism. So at certain points of crisis under which the status quo becomes untenable, right? There are changes happening in society amongst elites in terms of conflict, mobilization, protest, exogenous or, in, or endogenous. There are opportunities for regime transition that are shaped according to the power of the authoritarian incumbents and the mobilizing power of a kind of an insurgent opposition, right? Who is challenging at the elite level? Who is challenging authoritarians who are uh, status quo power holders? So one route to democratization is that is authoritarian led. Authoritarian incumbent parties recognize that they can't sustain the status quo and lead transitions to democracy, to multi-party competition, in which they are successful, in which they're sustained, they're maintained as a party and have a viable path forward in a new multi-party democratic dispensation. That work, Ghana and Senegal are key examples. I've written about this, for example, um, with Dan Slater and Daniel Ziblatt and Joe Wong in terms of looking at cross-regional cases of authoritarian-led democratization. And this is one route, a kind of high institutionalization route to democratization by maintaining 
the incumbent authoritarian incumbent party and the way in which they become democratized and democratic players. Right? So this is kind of a authoritarian led democratization that leads to high levels of institutionalization. The cases that I'm focusing on today, when we might be saying are even the more challenging cases, the most challenging cases potentially for democracy to be sustained over time because they come out of moments of great transition. They're truly transformative in terms of the nature of institutions being broken apart and reconstructed through transition and then made to endure over time. And so these are the cases that I'm looking at here today, South Africa, Benin, and the process by which we get to democracy is that the authoritarian incumbent is so overwhelmed by the crisis, um, status quo becomes unsustainable, that they are pushed to give up power, right? They exit and new opposition is triumphant, right? And the new opposition themselves shape the nature of the rules going forward. They shape new constitutions, they shape new political party systems, they shape the rules of the electoral system, voting mechanisms, the judicial system, right? New systems are crafted. And in that way, one might argue that at their outset, they're weaker, right? They need to become rooted in society. The processes of making them democratic need to be put into place and, and behavior needs to be oriented around these new institutions. And yet in some ways they're extremely democratic, right? Because they're participatory, they're reform-minded, they break the power of the former authoritarian incumbents. And so they're truly kind of multi-party opening, participatory and reformative. And then there are two different types of outcomes that are not democratic, right? The ways in which authoritarian incumbent parties can face moments of crisis, re-autocratize, right? Reform from within, new elites come to power from within the authoritarian party, right? They might shift from single party to a more military or more personalist mode of organizing. And this is Burundi, Zimbabwe, other cases in which a transition, a crisis happens, authoritarianism is maintained, but under new institutional forms. A fourth outcome of these kind of regime transition pathways is that opposition forces in kind of similar to this um, case, opposition forces employ other force, uh, forces of violence, coercion, take over, kick out the prior authoritarian incumbent party, but instead of establishing democracy, new forms of authoritarianism are established. So there are four kind of broad senses of regime pathways to lead to democratization. And this pathway that I'm exploring with you today is the one that I would argue is most democratic, um, most participatory, but also most weakly institutionalized in some senses, and perhaps most difficult to sustain. So it's a good case, a good set of cases for us to understand the mechanisms of democratic survival under challenging conditions. So how do we understand these pathways of democratic survival? I suggest that they often come out of these points of extreme crises, right? South Africa, Benin, in the early uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, were cases in which the dominant status quo of a single party communist uh, authoritarian regime in Benin and the apartheid uh, white racial hierarchy uh, segregated system in South Africa were no longer tenable. Authoritarian incumbents were experiencing mass protests, international pressures, uh, mobilization from below, factionalization and, and contestation within the elite about how best to move forward. And so the single party or um, competitive oligarchy uh, of South Africa were no longer sustainable. And so incumbent elites had to concede to some kind of partial inclusion, some kind of, of way of, of opening the system. Uh, because they prioritize their security and safety, their physical uh, lives going forward, right? So of course they want to maximize power. That's kind of my guiding assumption that at all times they wanted to maximize power, but they had to make some kind of inclusion in order to uh, maintain what they hoped would be to as much as they could hold on to. And insurgent opposition at these moments, of course they want to also maximize power. They want to come in, reform new systems, according to their preferences that would maximize how much representation they could get, how much state, how much of the state resources they would have access to control and to reorient towards their clientele, towards their followers. And yet the key issue at this moment, right, with this kind of insurgent opposition is that they have use to include in some limited form the outgoing incumbent elites because the outgoing incumbent elites have some control over the forces of security, 
right? They have control over some of the elements of the military, of the police, of different forces that, uh, that could upset the new regime going forward. So they have some use to maintain income and elites in that realm, that they have some use of the outgoing elites because they also um, contain uh, access to economic resources and, and control different sections of the economy that may be useful. This is absolutely the case in South Africa, in which the African National Congress as the insurgent opposition looked carefully at the set of options and there were absolutely different opinions uh, amongst the ANC as a, as a liberation movement, as a revolutionary movement about how much violence, how much exclusion should be used against the ruling national party. And said the, the dominant majority opinion going forward was that we need to prioritize security, safety, stability, and make this an inclusive coalition in which we will institutionalize power sharing, right? We will absolutely guarantee the outgoing incumbent elites a way to have a, a, a significant seat at the table. We will in fact overrepresent their interests in order to maintain economic security and stability and make a stable system, democratic system going forward. So in this sense, power sharing is at the core of this argument of how we get to democratic institutions by ostensibly non-democrats. There are a variety of different uh, ideological positions in all cases among the incumbent elite who are largely non-democratic. They really had to be pushed to this crisis moment to allow an opening. And among the insurgent opposition, there were many non-democrats in the insurgent opposition who could see a variety of pathways forward who were more revolutionary, who wanted to see a kind of social justice that would not necessarily be a kind of democratic uh, power sharing coalition outcome. Um, and there were um, opportunistic incumbent opposition elites who, who wanted to kind of reprioritize their own position, right? And we're not necessarily committed to democracy, but saw in democratic institutions a bounded power sharing agreement that could maximize security, stability, and elite resources amongst this slightly <coughs> large group that would include them all. And so the agreement, a limited degree of redistribution is key here. And it speaks to our fundamental theories about what democratization entails and how it's maintained over time. Because we could argue, so often we think that inequality is the, is, 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 um, in, in uh, the kind of detriment to um, democratic transition because of demands from below, right? The threat of redistribution is what keeps elites from transitioning to democracy. But in these cases, and in many others, I would argue more generally, that agreement on the limited degree of redistribution by slightly expanding the elite circle of who has access to state resources, to state contracts under um, processes of economic liberalization, allows a democratic bargain of power sharing and, and transition that does not redistribute to the masses. It is never based on redistribution to the masses. It's about a slightly expanded redistribution among who is considered political elites, who has access to these resources. And that allows an elite class to agree upon democratic institutions as an acceptable solution. So this kind of bargain is premised on the fact that there will not be class redistribution. And so macro security, state functionality, and reduced barriers to accumulation are really keys for kind of limiting discontents and th threats from within, threats from actors who could destabilize this power sharing bargaining. So democracy itself is the institutional um, uh, outcome of this kind of power sharing elite bargain. Um, so the, the threats that make democracy survive then is really about the ways in which um, this bounded power sharing becomes a way of maintaining intra-elite distribution of resources amongst this group of insurgent opposition and the former authoritarian incumbents and a way of limiting social pressures from below that might be in the form of protests, economic disruptions, and civic conflict. How does this actually play out in terms of maintaining over time? Because we can see it in the moment of transition, right? We can see the way in which this bargain is made, everyone moves towards multi-party competition. But the interesting thing about South Africa and Benin, right, is that democracy has been maintained for over three decades. We're moving into the fourth decade of democratic endurance, survival, 
through these institutions, even as elite interests reshape and are reformed by new patterns of accumulation that take place under the new democratic dispensation. So once uh, apartheid is over, of course, and there's a, a, a new sense of opportunity for Black empowerment in South Africa, new ways in which uh, the ANC channels state resources, contracts, creates public policy that can stimulate Black economic empowerment. So resources begin to be redistributed to some degree and creates a new uh, economic and political elite class that is tied to ANC uh, uh, rise. And similarly in Benin, you have economic liberalization that happens after the transition and new forms of elites are created through these accumulation processes, right? So whether or not you have control over the port of economic goods that are coming into Benin and being then sold uh, in Nigeria. And so controlling the Nigerian uh, import export market through Benin and whether or not you have the ability to control cotton trade, whether or not you have the ability to control media outlets, right? There are a whole set of resources that now become redistributed through this new expanded elite mechanism of power sharing. And so the question is, how does this democratic power sharing bargain sustain over decades when the actual economic and political resources of the bargain move in new directions? And here we think the parallel is very significant to the United States as we see democratic threats um, to an advanced industrial democracy in the way in which elite accumulation has become so centralized that you have new opportunities for um, factions from within this kind of uh, bounded power sharing, from within this kind of um, acceptance of elite accumulation through democratic institutions. And so the question is then, how do the institutions themselves become constraining as you have elites who seek to re-centralize, autocratize, take advantage of their new accumulations over the last decades, and potentially, since they were never necessarily committed to democratic ideologues in the first sense, uh, autocratize. And the key here is the way in which electoral systems are put in place, federal systems, party systems, judicial systems, the way in which they were formed at the moment of transition that can serve as lock-in or mechanisms of constraint that allow democracy to be sustained despite these new um, uh, processes of accumulation. The question is then that I think is, is really key in some senses, this is a political settlements type of argument, right? In the sense of strategic bargains, power sharing, uh, and, an, and a way of forming institutions that parallel that initial moment. But the question is, when do institutions then become themselves constraining, even as the underlying political settlement or, or power sharing uh, 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 shifts and changes? And so there are ways in which the institutions themselves begin to drift, right? We have gradual institutional change in the ways in which these political elite actors are using democratic institutions as subversive institutions, using the courts as opportunities to delegitimize opposition candidates, to make illegal opposition parties, using the legislature to legislate what types of party thresholds one has to uh, what kind of level of support one has to have in order to run as a political party in the next election, whether or not you need a certain level of legislative representation to be able to run mayoral candidates, whether your mayors then have to certify your candidates for president. So if you don't have at least 30% of the mayors across the country, you can't have an opposition candidate in the next presidential election. That's the way in which institutional drift has been occurring, for example, in Benin, that then begins to use these democratic institutions for subversive autocratization processes. So the question is really, when the distribution of power of elites shifts over time, when are the cases in which institutional constraints can maintain democratic bargains and serve as reservoirs of last resort against non-democratic actors? And when do the institutions themselves become co-opted by elites seeking to subvert democracy through democ uh, institutional means. And so then institutions themselves, as we've seen in the United States, as we've seen in Benin, as we see in South Africa, the institutions themselves become the locus of mobilization, the focal point of contestation about institutional practice, 
and how they can be made democratic in their consequence or made uh, as uh, uh, authoritarian uh, tools. So, oh, sorry, I went the wrong direction. So when are these institutional constraints maintained for democratic survival? I would say there are potentially three different levels that help us to understand when they serve as, as democratic enhancing institutions and avoid the kind of subversive drift towards autocratization. One is institutional strength itself. How strong is the, the party system? Can it resist personalization attempts? Can it resist uh, ways in which extra institutional new types of parties form that are uh, anti-system, right? Is it a way, are the parties themselves representative enough to be democratic actors because they have a continued stake in being elected through the democratic institution? So do they serve as channels of competition and therefore maintain a stake in democratic um, processes and procedures themselves? Also, the courts, how strong are the courts in terms of being institutions of judicial functioning or politicized agents of particular uh, elite agendas? Thirdly, federalism versus centralized systems. It's quite interesting when we look at the way in at least the comparison between South Africa and Benin, how federalism has served as a kind of reservoir for democratic institutional functioning versus a more centralized system where the national level courts, legislature, um, executive, if those institutions are captured and being used in a way that creates a kind of institutional drift towards more autocratization, uh, the local level governance in the United States or South Africa allows another level of democratic institutional functioning, a kind of check. And that relates to the third point in terms of interlocking institutions. How easy is it to co-opt one particular type of institution towards an autocratization purpose versus when the interlocking institutions create uh, barriers to that kind of uh, purposeful re-motivation of an institution for a different purpose than its original intention or its original formation? This also leads us to a question about what is the role of institutional adaptability? for strength, right? So here I'm arguing that institutional strength is a benefit for democratic maintenance, that it serves as a constraint against autocratizing pressures. And yet uh, institutional adaptability is a little bit of a danger in the sense of if it's so easy to adapt an institution to new purposes, it's not serving as that kind of constraint according to its original formation. The, the second or third factor is really the visibility of how that institution is being utilized. So is it very obvious to opposition, ruling parties, to, um, to society at large, that the locus of competition over democratic endurance and maintenance and continued functioning is through institutional uh, processes that we need to mobilize around institutions themselves as the way to protect democracy. So when institutional functioning is really at the center of, of whether or not we're contesting to maintain democracy, that is a key uh, to be able to avoid the subversive drift towards autocratization. So to get into the cases, um, I select Benin and South Africa. It's a kind of basic two, two country um, comparison, but I think that the two cases are really instructive to compare because they are in some ways very similar in terms of the kinds of macro structural challenges to democracy that they pose. They're places where democracy is difficult to sustain, but they're difficult to sustain for very different structural reasons. So the kinds of threats or, or challenges that um, Benin and South Africa face uh, create very different opportunities and, and challenges to democracy because in Benin, the kind of social cleavages that make and heterogeneity that makes democracy challenging is rooted in a kind of tripartite ethnic division. So the way in which uh, different regions of the country may see themselves as geographically and ethnically opposed to a shared set of, of public interests is very different from the racialized apartheid and the competitive oligarchy that has defi defined South Africa's political and economic structures over the last uh, decades. 
Also, Benin's history is one of extreme political instability, coups followed by uh, personalist military rule, uh, transitioning to a single party rule with full participation, whereas uh, South Africa was a, a competitive oligarchy with high levels of competition between white apartheid parties and very limited levels of participation, right? So obviously suffrage was, was not extended to the full set of, of South Africans and was limited to the white ruling class. And so in this way, they're at opposite ends of kind of a Dalian spectrum, where in, in Benin, you have very little competition, but you have full participation. Whereas in South Africa, you have institutionalized competition with limited participation. And so those types of transition in terms of what it means for this kind of democratic power sharing and the degree to which institutions can be um, transferred into the new system are kind of present very different possibilities. And then thirdly, uh, in Benin, the economic foundations were completely lacking. At the moment of tra democratic transition, and even through the decades of democratic contestation, it remains at the one of the lowest levels of GDP per capita, uh, a rentier state that is focused on who controls the state, who controls foreign aid, who controls the ports, right, and, and uh, ability to kind of extract from the state in order to reward your political followers is at the heart of the Beninese economy. Whereas in South Africa, there is a significant level of development, which has, is also um, categorized by the apartheid history of extreme racial inequality and segregation of white capital and the prioritization of that. And uh, a kind of, in, whereas in Benin, a lot of the shock was this kind of absolute state collapse and bankruptcy of the state itself, the inability to pay civil servants. In South Africa, it was kind of rising international sanctions, the disruption of the white economy that led to uh, the transition and the shock um, and that moment of, of uh, power sharing bargain. The ways too in which democratic survival against the odds has happened follows those kind of different um, uh, starting points in terms of in South Africa, the bargain that was struck and has been maintained is one that has maintained white capital, right? So those different kind of starting structural conditions also informed the nature of the power sharing bargain and political representation. So the institutions that were crafted overrepresented the prior authoritarian incumbents, the, the white uh, political parties, uh, the National Party, for example. In Benin, again, coming from this much more fluid tripartite division, the need to control the state, consensus rule has been institutionalized, both through political party fluidity, the ability for anyone to form a political party, to come into the, the com competitive uh, landscape, and then to bandwagon along with the presidential party as that has changed over successive rounds and, and be a part of the presidential coalition in the legislature so that everyone has access, right? This whole expanded set of power sharing, uh, bounded power sharing allows everyone to be at the table and to get their share of this rentier state. And there are legislative protections that maintain this kind of rule by consensus so that changes really need to be made by consensus so that no one sliver of a former uh, elite section will be excluded, right? So you have to get almost a unanimous support for kind of legislative changes to make sure that everyone has their needs uh, um, played out in this um, democratic power sharing. So what does this look like specifically in South Africa to get into the cases, right? So there's this moment of crisis, international sanctions, the ruling national party, uh, recognized that against their wishes, again, their goal was to maintain the system as it was for as long as they could. And there were different ideas about how that could be done, how much force should be used, how long they should hold on to this racialized apartheid society. And at a certain point, the degree to which protest, economic collapse, uh, mobilist strikes, uh, uh, civil, civic uprisings were becoming so threatening to the ruling elite that it became a crisis moment and the authoritarian incumbents decided to, to move to the bargaining table. Now the incoming opposition, the African National Congress Party, recognized the economic necessity of inclusion. And this is a key element of then how the political institutions were crafted that allowed democracy to be stable and uh, maintained by all as seen as a kind of valid uh, uh, compromise on the outcome. The authoritarian incumbent outgoing National Party retained a stable voter block, uh, particularly through these federal systems 
in which they had geographical control of key areas, Cape Province, for example, uh, and able to, to have local governance that really allowed them to maintain a set of, of, of political and economic um, uh, priorities. And then the institutional basis of competition was expanded. So moving to a proportional representation system, again, allowed the outgoing national uh, party to be sure that they would have a <laughs> representation that was equal to their population and through federal and local governance to be able to have additional uh, slots at the table to overrepresent their key interests. In Benin, the inclusive and power sharing uh, bargain was uh, quite opposite in terms of the outgoing authoritarian incumbent party was a military uh, uh, regime that had transitioned into a single party. And so when they broke apart, it was really a kind of, they spread everywhere and they spread everywhere and their interests were not represented in one single entity that could be uh, represented through uh, a new legislature. Uh, and so they were formed into a number of different new parties that could be kind of personalist, right? That represented a particular geographic or ethnic uh, a stronghold. And um, the, incoming, um, uh, the incoming party, uh, opposition party recognized significance of what types of powers the outgoing authoritarian incumbent had. And so while crafting very inclusive institutions did not seek to disqualify the outgoing authoritarian incumbents. They said, absolutely, they'll still have a seat at the table, not in terms of the old party as such, but as individuals, right? That the outgoing military leaders were still invited to the national conference to help craft the constitution, to help set the new electoral system. And military neutrality was a key element of thinking about how the institutional democratic bargain was crafted because they did not want right to create spoilers that would come in uh, after the fact and, and uh, upset the democratic bargain. And so access to state resources was maintained through this way of understanding former military leaders were going to form parties and they should be able to contest and that everyone would be um, at the table. So how have these played out now when we think about the possibility for whether or not these power sharing bargains were sustainable despite new patterns in accumulation. Um, and what type of drift has occurred? So in Benin since 2019, there has been dramatic autocratization. The current incumbent president, President Talon, has used the courts to decertify in, uh, opposition parties, to disqualify the majority of, of um, opposition candidates, and the legislature too has been used in this kind of bandwagon sense to, uh, to create new rules that disqualify opportunities for uh, opposition parties to get the necessary certification um, to maintain. And yet the ways in which the ability of society to uh, continue to reinvent the democratic bargain through the fluidity of parties, through uh, mobilizing protests around maintaining constitutionalism has been quite key to the possibility, the viability, the protection of what the democratic institutional focus as the locus of competition uh, uh, possibly allows for the future. So we see in Benin a case of institutional drift in which these formal institutions of democracy were established, the judicial system, the party system, the electoral system, and are now being used as tools of autocratization. And in part, it's largely because the way in which the extreme concentration of economic power in one single individu individual, President Tamun, uh, has become a kind of de-democratization by extreme centralization. So the high degree of inequality is not a threat to democracy because of protests from below, because of demand for redistribution, but because of the extreme inequality and over-representation of, of, of economic and political uh, resources in one particular person, or it could be kind of a, a one particular kind of elite group that then de-resources uh, opposition a possibility to fight back and to use institutions as the way to do so. In South Africa, the, uh, the degree of corruption um, is also a kind of threat to democratic endurance, but I would say to a much lesser degree than in Benin. So we have seen democratic uh, 
endurance questioned in South Africa um, because of, of the way in which um, corruption has lessened democratic accountability, questions over the rule of law, but in South Africa to a greater extent, in part because of the ways in which institutions are more interlocking. The party system is stronger according to this kind of legacy of having um, that institutionalized competition and, and expanding participation. The party systems, the internal alternation and the reliance on the judicial system has allowed Jacob Zuma, for example, to be brought to trial, to be tried uh, to the party to move on beyond uh, one particular leader and to use institutions to maintain democracy itself. So the two cases are diverging now in terms of the ways after 30 years, in terms of the way institutional drift is putting democracy in danger uh, in, in Benin and the ways in which this kind of elite power sharing bargain has been disrupted according to the patterns of accumulation that occurred under uh, democratic stability. So, I have just a few alternative explanations for democratic survival, as, whereas I argue it's really this focus on power sharing and its institutionalized forms. There are two other kind of possibilities that are presented both in the larger project by other authors and, uh, and uh, in other countries. And that is the extent to which international powers really help explain democratic survival in these difficult and challenging conditions. So absolutely, there were a kind of macro contexts for economic and political crises, and that did play into the transition in the first part. But as Levitsky and Ray tell us in competitive authoritarianism and in many other um, kind of um, empirical ex explanations, those economic and political crises and the changing geopolitical condition and the Cold War um, and the type of aid that stabilized uh, democracy the imposition of South African sanctions, these all helped us transition to multipartyism, but they cannot explain actually arriving at and sustaining democracy versus a kind of sustainable competitive authoritarianism. So in this sense, the pressures, um, the international powers did help to create a transition moment. They kind of helped to create that sense of, um, of crisis that led to transitions but they don't explain the outcome of, of really democratic resilience, which we don't see across a number, many, many other countries that transition to um, multi-party competition at that time. And then finally, the normative commitments to democracy. Again, um, some of the other authors in the project really suggest that you have to have democratic ideologues to sustain democracy, whereas the ways in which we see in Benin in particular, that the former authoritarian incumbent um, president under 20 years of, of uh, military single party rule, President Karakou is re-elected in the democratic period and tries to subvert democracy, right? He's tempted to run for third terms. He tries to undo constitutional term limits. And yet the institutional bargains and the focus on constitutionalism, the third term term limit uh, debate mobilizes protests to convince him to stay away from changing the constitution and maintain that kind of power sharing bargain of fluidity and transition. And there are varied views in South Africa and many about what democracy could entail, what it should look like, what is social justice for the African National Congress, should we even go for democracy? That wasn't a foregone conclusion. There were a variety of ideological positions about what um, power sharing might look like and whether or not that was a, a desirable end. There were different conceptions of what racial redistribution should look like and what good governance should look like. So there were not necessarily one vision of a kind of democratic outcome that was uh, either predisposed or maintained over the many years of democratic survival. So what does this tell us about the world today? Um, and our grave concerns about uh, democratic backsliding and autocratization more generally. I think that these two cases are quite significant in that they epitomize the use of institutional drift, the way in which democratic institutions, judicial, electoral, legislative, executive, are being repurposed for subversion of democratic practice and functioning. And so focusing in on how those institutions can be protected, maintained, utilized, and, and repurposed back towards democratic resilience is a key focus for comparative democratization scholars across the world. Um, what are the constraints to this kind of institutional drift? The distribution of power across elites. So over concentration 
of economic and political resources within one sector of the elites can undo, upsets the balance of this kind of broader power sharing bargain. And I think we see that in many places across the world today. A counter mobilization of, of alternative resources from below allows contestation, protest, mobilization around the democratic value of institutions. And that's what us non-elites have. That is largely the only thing that us non-elites have, right? It's the ability to protest around the democratic value and functioning of, of democratic, nor, of nominally democratic institutions that we can't take for granted that they function as democratic institutions. And then inequality is a threat to democracy, not because of demands from below, but because it reduces this kind of inter-elite uh, power sharing alliance when it becomes so extremely concentrated. So thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Thanks so much, Rachel. You're free to sit or stand. There's no camera anymore. against us. Thanks to Nora and Amy for trying to enable that. And thanks, Rachel, for bearing with us. Um, so any questions? Um, I, I'll ask the first, and I have I2 and Jamie. Um, so I, I know that you've noted the, oh, God, that's my favorite. <laughs> 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 okay. um, I will, so this, come in on the table. Excuse me? My adult is to come out on the table and just say, I don't Yeah, I think it's just, it's, um, yes, it's been less finicky. So, you know, counter mobilization and popular mobilization. I'm wondering if you um, see a role here. I'm thinking of Nancy Bermeo's work and some of Jennifer Gandhi's work, arguing that the public really doesn't necessarily care about some of this mobilization. But it's been such a moment of discontent with all the global protests since 2017. Do you see that autocratization is more likely or less likely in moments of popular discontent? Is there any relationship between public attitudes and whether or not leaders are willing to take on these more audacious sort of de-democratizations? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, should we gather questions? Let's do that. Okay, so I too and Jamie, and then we'll stop. I just want to uh, I just want to ask about like the role of decentralization because I was thinking that you are going to talk about decentralization as a way of power sharing and just like inclusion more elites to the system, but you actually like talked about it in a different way. And I also wanted to ask about like the courts in South Africa were not established during the transition, right? So they were not established as a way of power sharing between the elites. So they are repurposing. Uh, was actually possible because the courts were established before the mm -hmm. crisis situation. So, I mean, don't you need just like these long standing institutions for the democratic endurance? Is the second question. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Janie? Um, so, thanks so much for this. It was fascinating. Um, I wanted to see if you had thoughts about applying the theory. I, I can evaluate South Africa well enough. I can't evaluate the being the value of how South Africa makes plenty of sense. With details that the, the core works, I did really well. But about comparing using it to eliminate other cases, um, I was trying to brainstorm as you were going about ones that would be useful, and I think there are a lot. Um, on, on the African continent, maybe Kenya. Um, Nigeria is an obvious one to ask about, although size, of course, confounds somewhat, and resource comes about the simplicity of the economy. Um, elsewhere, a bunch of Eastern Europe possibilities, size is a little bit tricky, but Poland uh, gets close to South Africa. Um, Russia would be fascinating, although uh, I would even not try to comment if not two Russia experts in the room. Um, but uh, Argentina and Chile, uh, Indonesia and Brazil, that gets you pretty far afield from your background, I know, but you know, well, that's lots. Pretty fascinating to hear what you think about the application. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, let me start from the bottom, the, the end. Um, so absolutely, I've, I've been thinking a lot about other cases. And in fact, thinking about the other cases kind of drove me to this point of like, which cases would be illustrative and help us to understand the processes. Kenya, absolutely, I think it is a great example. And it builds on like Leo Ariola's work in terms of thinking about the way in which new elites were formed through processes of accumulation, in Kenya's case, right, privatization and economic liberalization, the way in which that formed a new set of opposition elites that allowed new types of power sharing bargains to be struck in this kind of elite uh, system of, of accommodation, expanded access, right, who's in and who's out is no longer a question of like, yes, there are opposition 
camps uh, that are mobilized around political party competition, but the sense of power sharing at the top is very well um, uh, demonstrated as a way of securing stability and, and continuing kind of access to the state resources and economic accumulation opportunities through, through that power sharing bargain. Um, I would love to hear what others think uh, about you know, kind of some of the other regional cases, but what I think is really instructive about Benin and, and parallels to many, many places around the world in this particular moment of autocratization, how are we thinking about the possibilities for democratic resilience versus institutional drift, is that President Talon is the perfect example of this kind of autocratic, anti-institutionalist, anti-party leader who has come into power and tried to change institutions to be able to further centralize power. And he has been able to do so in part because of the patterns of accumulation over the last 30 years. And so I think we see that parallel in actors like Trump, you know, actors uh, in, in, in Brazil, um, and the way in which the anti-institutionalist mindset um, is, is working in the favor of institutional drift, right? Because we can deconstruct what the institutions are meant to do because the system as it is, is with this kind of growing sense of inequality is not necessarily working, so to speak. And then these actors capitalize on that to further deconstruct the institutions from within. Um, and so I think that that parallel is quite, uh, quite widespread and speaks to this kind of global moment. Um, and I would love to kind of explore, you know, cross-regional application. Um, and the question of, of decentralization, you're absolutely right in terms of South Africa, the way in which decentralization guaranteed regional strongholds, guaranteed a sense of authority, but also because it guaranteed a broader sense of power sharing for particular local level officials, local level elected uh, representatives. So it expanded the set of possibilities for the outgoing national party and the white apartheid political elites to maintain uh, office, to maintain uh, representative power. Um, so it, it expanded the kind of possibilities. Um, and in that way, I think was absolutely key to the bargain that was struck. I think that the federal system in South Africa, it's Right now, we look at South Africa and we might say, of course, it was going to become a multiracial democracy right at the end of apartheid. That is never a foregone conclusion, right? The fact that it transitioned was an incredible feat, right? And yet, the fact that it's been maintained uh, despite all of these kind of internal challenges, the way in which redistribution has not been uh, ever kind of a question, but uh, an expanded set of economic opportunities for a new rising elite has been created. I mean, all of these are part of a kind of compromised sense of power sharing at the initial moment. And then absolutely your argument about courts, I think speaks directly to the kind of parallel I was making about political parties in the sense of a kind of Dolly inversion of institutional constraints have held in South Africa to a greater degree than in Benin, in part because of a greater degree of institutionalization coming out of the competitive oligarchy. Right, the fact that courts were pre-established, the fact that political parties were pre-established and had a kind of institutionalized uh, processes to them that then were transformed absolutely in this moment of transition, but not completely transformed and repurposed. And so in this moment, even as new patterns of political uh, of, of, um, resource accumulation occur, the courts have had more durability as a constraining mechanism even in the face of great challenges, right? Because the African National Congress is trying one of their own, right? And, and it's been used as a mechanism by the party to maintain internal party co co cohesion and, and kind of kick out threats to their ongoing dominance. And so in that way, it's been an interesting use of the judicial system in order to maintain party dominance. And that is the work of these kind of interlocking democratic institutions. So I think it's a, a perfect parallel. And then the question about counter mobilizations and, and popular mobilization is such a good one. And, you know, in this story, I've, I've left out really the masses, right? really the public, except to the degree to which public can rally and serve as counter mobilization, right? To what degree do they serve as an alternative force to this kind of power sharing elite bargain when it's unraveling and the institutions are made in the kind of subversive autocratizing direction? So does popular discontent matter? 
I'm going to venture to say that it could go in two directions, right? On one hand, popular discontent can feed the kind of President Tamil Trump anti-institutionalist. We're not get rallying around democratic institutions as our uh, as our route forward, as our salvation, right? Because this, there's this other model. On the other hand, the potential to rally around voting rights, to rally around the ability for opposition parties to get registered to compete in Benin, which they're being denied, right? That is kind of the key necessity to maintain um, institutions, uh, democratic democracy under these kind of moments of drift. And so the degree to which popular, popular discontent is channeled toward one or the other, I think is absolutely key uh, towards what we see in this in the future. Great. All right. I have Catherine, Anna, and then Nick. Uh, so Hi. I'm Catherine. Uh, welcome to CDRL. I'm Catherine Stoner. I'm the director. I have been for seven weeks now. <laughs> so I'm an old hand, <laughs> as you know. Um, so really interesting. I, I'm one of the two Russia specialists in the room. The other one is lurking in the background. Mm -hmm. And this is a bit more your thing. You're, you're the one who wrote about the transition stuff. Uh, maybe I said my name. <laughs> um, anyway, so maybe Michael has a comment on this too. But so a couple of things. First, doesn't the kind of crisis matter? You just black box that mm -hmm. on us. So um, it seems to me that that would matter in the kind of bargain you could strike, right? And so since I have a eminent East Europeanist sitting next to me, I'm going to let her cover, <laughs> cover that. Um, but you know, the, the Poland was raised as the key. Sorry, this is so bad. Uh, <laughs> Poland was raised as the you know case that you might compare. J and I thought that too, Jamie. But you know, this is really a negotiated pact, right? They have these round table talks. And even Poland's in trouble right now. Mm -hmm. So how, my question is time horizons, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and now the institutions are being captured and probably the same way you're saying here. And, mm -hmm. and that was one where we would have looked at at, at this time, uh, you know, T1 as Poland's got it going on, things are going to go well there, you know, stand out of the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, and yet they're not. And so it was, it was almost like your perfect condition here, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. um, then I think mentioning the US is confusing and again for the time issue. So our institutions are sticky, right? Like these are 200 years old. You're talking about cases that are what, like 20, mm -hmm. um, maybe. Um, and so I just wonder if that, you know, there are some pathologies that are, are similar and then some that are just not, mm -hmm. right? Um, Russia, there's no point in raising. There was no bargain post nine. I mean, when you blow up your parliament, you're not bargaining really. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was, and, and that's what Yeltsin did. In, 1993, and then they just broke the institutions. There's no power sharing. There's mm -hmm. no, this isn't a case of any of this, or maybe Mike will see this differently, but I think, you know, they, they wrote a constitution with a super powerful executive on purpose, uh, and then Putin just used that. Um, so he didn't even have to, you know, subvert institutions. There they were. He just used the powers that were given to him, and since then, it's gotten worse. Um, so I guess those are my questions and, and comments. It, it seems to me like if there's a lot of violence um, and external pressure, like the South Africa, the world is watching them. It's a little overdetermined in a sense that maybe they'll produce institutions, especially given the residue of the system that was there before. Um, and they have a little more economic development and you have all the things that go into maintaining a democracy. They got a lot of those things, as you said, to begin with. And Benin does not. So to me, it's not surprising that a pact struck in Benin, especially on the basis that you mentioned here and where they don't have any of those things, things unravel fast. Mm -hmm. And lastly, how is this different from the pacting literature that we would have read in the, what we did read in the 1980s, I'm guessing you read this. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in, in Latin America, for example, it mm -hmm. seems to me this is kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. All right, Anna. Um, Rachel, thank you so much for having uh, I just have a brief question. Are you um, explaining democratic resilience or regime durability? Right, because many of the same things that you talked about, like power sharing, an enlarged selectorate, um, agreement on redistribution, institutional strength, and even institutional thrift as a sort of subversion mechanism, all apply to autocracies as well. Great. All right, Nick. Great. Um, so I have a, a, an observation and then, and then a question. Um, and my, my observation builds on this, this point that, 
Jamie had, um, which is that superficially knowing nothing about Benin, I was very struck by the similarities with Indonesia, um, sort of transition from military rule. Military rulers are then welcomed at the table in a sort of power sharing multi-party agreement. Um, but then they have this legislative process that I think is sort of unusual, that's sort of consensus based. But as you say, Benin is sort of sliding towards autocratization and Indonesia, I argue, um, I would argue is not. Um, but my question is, I guess, how do we, how do we identify or how do we know when these institutional changes that you're talking about are subverting democracy or, or rather saving it? So in Indonesia, um, they're, they're currently debating whether or not to increase the legislative vote threshold from four to 5%. Mm -hmm. um, and your interpretation of Benin is that this is sort of subverting democracy. Um, but I think in Indonesia, my interpretation would cut the other way. Um, so I think they're trying to prevent these sort of fringe, in particular, Islamist parties who are keen on destabilizing democracy from getting a toehold in parliament. Um, so, so I guess my question is, I think somewhat academic, but how do we distinguish between um, what are two observationally equivalent possibilities? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you so much. Excellent questions. Okay, to start with the last first. Um, so absolutely, Indonesia is a really fascinating and important comparison, and in some ways, um, um, kind of Dan Slater and I have you know, been talking about the ways in which that is similar in terms of this kind of broad power sharing agreement. Everyone's in, I think he calls it promiscuous star sharing, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, and so yeah, absolutely, and Benin is a very parallel case. And so what is fascinating, I think I would argue about this question of how is institutional adaptation either subverting or, or reinforcing democracy, right? Because our the use of democratic institutions can be Kind of continually put to use to reinforce and kind of reshape democratic practice to match the needs. Mm -hmm. And so what determines whether or not it's put to one end or the other? And often, you know, I don't I, I think that in one hand, the way in which the continued nature of the need for the strategic pact or power sharing across a number of elites, maybe in the Indonesian case kind of remains broad. Whereas in Benin, the over-concentration of all resources in kind of this one particular person or the kind of talent group has been so detrimental. In, in particular, because President Talon in Benin funded all of the other opposition parties. So the prior two presidents before him, uh, Karaku and Yayibuni, both sought to undo term limits. They both wanted to stay on. They weren't democratic ideologues in any chance, by any measure. But, um, yeah, yeah, Muni, the current uh, uh, president, Talon, the current president, who was kind of just amassing economic resources because of his inroads with the uh, uh, political elite of all stripes, funded all of the opposition activity. He funded all of the parties. And so when uh, under Yaya Boni, he, uh, he, he tried to kind of uh, reduce Talon's economic opportunity and kind of kick him out of control of the port and, and, and make him flee the country. And so then at that moment, Talon decided, okay, I need to control the political game. It's not enough to just control the economic game because I'm too vulnerable. So I need to also control and, and centralize and limit and, and, and take away the potential threat to my continued supremacy in this domain. And so in that sense, the accumulation patterns in Benin led to this, uh, the possibility of then subverting democratic institutions uh, through this kind of over-concentration and the desire to do so rather than maintaining the pact that had been the kind of power sharing burden that had been in place for the last 30 years and, and allowed it to continue despite uh, executives trying to undo it. Um, so in that sense, both of the weakness, to come back to the earlier point, the weakness of institutions, right, that they weren't necessarily around for this, you know, the stickiness of hundreds of years, that they weren't um, deeply institutionalized, allowed the participation, the broad, uh, the broad accessibility, but ultimately it makes this kind of drift much more easy uh, to, to go in this diverting direction. Um, and then the question about regime durability, uh, absolutely. In fact, I think um, the, the ways, that, so in kind of laying out the four regime pathways, um, these mechanisms could describe 
the variety of, of those four outcomes, right? And the ways in which potentially authoritarian led democratization in terms of uh, the, the ongoing um, resilience of those regime outcomes, it could definitely apply to autocrats as well. And in fact, um, that's in some ways, you know, I'm building on a kind of strategic bargaining and political settlements literature, but in other ways, I'm pushing back against it to try to understand when are institutions constraining and don't just shift because the political settlement is shifting, right? When do they uh, serve to maintain the regime despite other types of pressures, be they counter mobilization in favor of democracy to the authoritarian regime or um, autocratizing pressures against the regime. So I, I absolutely do think that you know, the regime durability comes back to this sense of like what allows institutional constraints despite the shifting structural factors under underlying it and a kind of elite uh, strategic pressures underlying it. So when writ large, when do regimes endure despite the alternations in the makeup of what kind of led to that regime in the first place. Um, and then Catherine, great, fantastic questions. Um, so does the kind of crisis matter? On one hand, does it shape the kind of bargain you can make? So again, coming back to this different type of pathways argument, I think the crisis matters in the degree to which the former authoritarian incumbent is like completely kicked out and how much say they have in crafting the new set of institutions. So in the authoritarian led democratization, the Ghana, the Senegal, um, they have a lot of power in crafting the new institutions. So there, the, the degree of crisis matters, the degree to which the authoritarian incumbents can stay in, at the head of the table, not just kind of at the table. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, maybe in, in kind of the, the Russian case, um, right, where, where parliament is blown up, you know, they don't have a seat at the table. And in so many ways, I think that is the parallel of Benin. They absolutely didn't have a seat at the table in terms of crafting the new institutions. But the question amongst, well, the military was invited back in to help craft the new institutions. So maybe there's a difference there. But the, the concern, the overriding concern at the moment of the national conference and the established new, the new electoral system is, in part to prioritize participation, in part to prioritize the accessibility of the system, uh, because the concern that these autocratic elites are lurking there, you know, potential spoilers, right? They're, they're out there and how can they be brought in to be able to not, um, they weren't institutionalized in as in the authoritarian led democratization, but they are not excluded. So in that way, maybe it's a little bit more similar than that the power sharing is, um, is open and institutionalized as fluid rather than like in South Africa in a very different way. It is, it is um, institutionalized in a way that says this percentage will go to you. These domains will go to you. And in Benin, it's much more like you're just, you're, you can come in depending on how well you're able to fit into the new system. Um, and then, as I said, kind of to the degree, yes, the US is, is problematic because of the, the, we assume that the US institutions and they are, you know, much more institutionalized, they're deeply enduring. But I think that the underlying problematic that draws me to this question is one that is happening across well-established democracies and newer democracies you know, places in which we would never expect democracy to be resilient in the first place. And so maybe what's helpful is to understand um, the degree to which we see parallel processes or not. And if they're holding in the United States to a greater degree, if we don't see these same kinds of institutional drift, which in some ways we do, but where do we see the institutional constraint? That can help tell us too about the problems <laughs> back into these cases where it's much more nascent and uh, un, uh, potentially de- uh, less institutionalized, how, where might we expect institutional constraints to hold that are the kind of backstop for this drift and, um, and how can we support it from a policy or, you know, citizen mobilization kind of perspective. And so too, back to the US, then what do these cases tell us about how we could support democratic endurance in the United States? So there are definitely differences in those degrees that are important. 
All right, we have four minutes left. I have three people left on um, my list. So, so that Rachel can get the comments, please have a brief, brief comment or question. Um, Marissa, Hisham, and then Brett. Rachel, you can respond to anything you'd like and then we'll wrap up at 1245. Okay, thank you so Marissa. much. Okay, quickly. Um, so what is the hope for democracy in Africa beyond South Africa? Which countries, you know, and I was particularly interested in Senegal and Ghana, but it's other case of authoritarian led democracy where um, if you don't have these original power sharing agreements to begin with, how can you create them? It seems though it's become more polarized there between the opposition comes in and we see backsliding in Senegal as well. So if you could talk about sort of the hope for democracy in Africa, mm -hmm. based on your analysis. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the great presentation. I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible, but I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about some of the conceptual issues that the broader project uh, that you referenced at the beginning grappled with. And specifically, I'm just curious because I really liked what you mentioned earlier with regards to the fact that studying uh, democratic survival is not the same thing as studying the absence of democratization. But ultimately, the way you talk about the cases, it sounds to me like you, the emphasis or the basis of comparison between you know, Benin and South Africa is very specific. It's about the negative case. It's about the absence of democratic backsliding through institutional autocratization versus another situation where, uh, going back to what Catherine mentioned, which is the challenge that democracy is, um, is, is going through, uh, beauty matters in that context, you know, be it a military coup, uh, popular mobilization and such. I'm just wondering how does the broader project grapple with these issues and selecting cases that are comparable, that make sense, um, and uh, in terms of defining the universe of, of cases for the findings of your project. Thank you. Great, thank you. Great, um, Rachel, I, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, thank you for your awesome, very thought-provoking. So, uh, so my question is empirical, but I think has sort of a theoretical implication. So I, I guess as I was sort of thinking, you know, um, about Benin, you know, in a way it's sort of hard to know precisely what it's a case of, um, because you know, so much is sort of being determined as we speak, right? So Talon has you know, said, I guess as recently as August, that he, you know, he won't pursue a third term. But, you know, I mean, he hollowed out in some sense the institution so quickly. Um, I think probably surprising everyone, I mean, the, the crackdown against the journalists began, you know, like a year after he took power. So, you know, in a way, is it, you know, can we all be confident that you know, people you know, abide by the promises? Definitely not, right? So, so I guess I'm trying to sort of understand precisely what it's you know, kind of what it's a case of. But then it's, I, I tell me understand that I would love to know precisely how you envision it and right? kind of like you know what um, what forces will be key in determining whether he abides by by the third term promise. Um, and you know as you as you respond, I mean I. I'm trying to imagine the response will be, you know, public counter mobilization precisely around the democratic institutions that citizens sacrifice so profoundly to, to secure. Um, but then, you know, doesn't kind of that balance of power between citizens and, and fellow security forces also kind of really suggest some role for international pressure, um, potentially to constrain. This is, it seems to me, a much more kind of forgiving international environment with the rise of this engagement. Um, and so, I guess I was really curious whether. You wanted to kind of, um, you know, set aside the power of sort of these international forces um, as thoroughly as you suggested in the final slide. All right, it's we're at time. But Perfect. One final comment from Rachel. Perfect. I wish I could see the future because it would really help. Me. <laughs> 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 we, all, we all have experienced many times. But I'll just say that counter mobility. I absolutely don't think that international pressure is really. Um, going to drive what happens, and um, definitely because of the changes in the international environment itself, um, and also because of the way in which how democracy has been sustained in Benin for the last 30 years is because of this kind of counter mobilization under Karaku, under Yayiboni, and etc. And so the degree to which, in a more than you know, productive international environment for democracy, it still didn't come down to the internationals, right? Like it, it definitely came down to these domestic. Um, mobilizations. And so to that degree, I think, you know, this project and what Benin is a case of and South Africa as well is that like the fact that democracy survived for 30 years is in and of itself something interesting to understand how that happened. 
And now, you know, the degree to which institutions hold or are subverted also tells us a great deal about um, the way in which power sharing and institutional. So before the kind of breakdown in, in Benin in 2019, I would have said to many people that like they're both South Africa and, and Benin are both high quality democracies, right? Because they're very differently institutionalized, but the participatory nature of Benin was significant in terms of the quality. But now we're really seeing the weakness of institutions and how that risks democratic endurance. Um, and I think that that's really the key case here in terms of what the future holds. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel, for flying all the way from Ithaca. <laughs> in person and making my first in-person event so, so productive and generative. Thank you.